All right, now what I'm starting tonight, it's, it's kind of like a little series, but I'm not necessarily going to go, you know, Sunday night this week, Sunday night next week. I'm, I'm going to be introducing this topic of how to serve God based on who you are. So how to serve God tonight, I'm going to preach on how to serve God if you are a woman, if you are a female. Uh, in the future, I'm going to be preaching one for men, and then I'm also going to be preaching one for children. So I haven't laid out exactly when I'm going to preach these, but there's, it's, a, it's one in a series. Now, um, don't get too worried about this, man. You know, this is going to be primarily designed for women. However, it is important, for example, if you're raising daughters as a man to, to hear everything that's preached tonight. It's, it's definitely going to be very applicable for, for how you raise your, ch your children, especially a daughter. And it's also just good to have sound doctrine in understanding, you know, some of the differences between how a woman might serve God and how a man might serve God. Now, there's obviously going to be areas where everything overlaps and everybody has work to do, and there's, that's a lot of... of the work to be done can be shared by everybody, okay? But there's some definitely significant differences, and we're going to cover some of those tonight. So I'm going to go through, um, if you're a woman, what are some of the things, not, uh, not everything, but some of the things that you should be focused on. Now, obviously, you know, we should be focused on Bible reading, on prayer, on sewing, and, and you know, the list can go on and on and on and on and on for what a Bible believer should be doing in their life. But I'm trying to cover somewhat more gender-specific roles when I'm dealing with this topic, if that makes sense. So um, what I'm first going to point out are there's a few areas of service, and keep your finger in Romans 16, we're going to be coming back to this, but if you want to flip over to 1 Timothy chapter number 3, I'm just going to start off the sermon by going over some of the areas that are prohibited by God for a woman to serve Christ or to, to you know, if, you, if you're here, if you're a woman today and you say, I want to serve God, I want to do what it is that God has laid out for me to do for him. There's a few things that I can tell you 100% as a fact that God doesn't want you to do as a woman. And we're going to look at that in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's not very much. Okay, and, and I, I'm not going to spend very much time on this aspect, because, but I, just, I need to bring it up um, because there's a lot of false doctrine out there and uh, a lot of people believe different, even though I think you'll see how clearly this is written just in black and white. So look at 1 Timothy 3, chapter 1. This is the chapter that goes over all the qualifications for someone to be a bishop or an elder or a pastor. Those words are basically used synonymously. If someone wants to be the pastor of a church, which is what we typically uh, know the office as, but look at verse number one, it says, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given hospitality, apt to teach. So then it goes on and on about all the different qualifications, characteristics that a pastor ought to have in order to be able to fill that role as a pastor in that service to God. God has ordained, and, and if you weren't here on uh, Wednesday night, we went over 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and if you, if you haven't listened to that, I, I encourage you to get the, um, the, the, watch the video or, or get the audio for that sermon, because that chapter really covered how everybody in our church is a member of, you know, we're, we're all members of the church and it's in this body is we're, we're part of the body of Christ. And we all have different functions, just like your own body has different functions, right? Your eyes, your ears, they all do different things. Well, we all have different functions within the church and God has different work laid out for us to do. Now, a lot of it's going to be the same. And we're going to, like I said, we're going to have some overlap and we're all going to have the same goal as one body. But every single member is important in this church. Every single one. So don't ever think that you are not important, that you don't have that much to contribute. Yes, you do. And, and listen to the whole sermon because I'm not going to re-preach it even though I'm tempted to because it's, it's such an important truth to learn for every single person in the church to understand how important you are individually as a member. And as a member of this one big body, you also ought to be focused on being the best member that you can to serve God to the utmost. And tonight we're going to be focusing on women. So one of the offices, one of the members of this body, of this local church, 
One of the parts, one of the roles is being the pastor. It's not the only role. There's plenty of roles to fill, but this is one. And according to the Bible, the bishop is someone that has to be the husband of one wife. So right off the bat, you see, you know, I mean, these days you got all kinds of weird perverted things going on. But just speaking normally, you're not going to find a woman that's the husband of one wife. Right. So if, if one of the qualifications to be a pastor is to be the husband of one wife, that automatically just just discounts um, a woman as having that job. And we're going to see a few other verses that will back this up a little bit further. You could say, oh, well, he's just using the, the male uh, form there, but you can apply it to women the same way. No, you can't. Now, if you jump down a little bit to verse 12, you're going to see the same thing about the deacons. It says, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. So it's the same wording. Flip back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 14. This is going to line up perfectly with what I'm trying to show you about the bishop being the husband of one wife. When you look at 1 Corinthians 14, it's just back a few chapters from, uh, or a few books from 1 Timothy. 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 34. The Bible reads, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, I didn't write the Bible. But I believe it to be God's word. And I'm not going to preach this in a condescending manner because I don't think it needs to be condescending. But it's still the truth that God has ordained men and women to be different. God has made us obviously very different. God has given us different attributes and different values and different, different, different functions that he wants us to perform. God enjoys the differences between a man and a woman. I enjoy the differences between a man and a woman. I'm really glad my wife is not like a man. I would not, I would not be married to her if she was like a man. I love that she is a woman. And I'm sure that she loves that I'm a man. And that we're different and that we have different abilities and strengths and different roles. I know that she's happy that I work hard to support the family and that she's able to raise our children. I'm happy that she raises our children and she's really good at that. And these are some of the roles that God has given that are different between men and women. And just because they're different doesn't make one better than the other. And here is an example of that where it's very clear. I mean, I don't see how you could look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 14 and read the context later, write it down, go back home, read the whole chapter, read the whole book. I'm not just yanking a verse out of context. It's written very clear. He just says very specifically, let your women keep silence in the churches because it's not permitted for them to speak. Now, if it's not permitted for the women to speak in the church, and then he says, if they're going to learn anything, let them ask their husband at home, do you really think it's a woman's job to get up here, to stand behind the pulpit, and teach the Bible to a whole congregation when it's not even permitted for them to speak? Absolutely not. I mean, that just goes completely violates Scripture. And it says here, it's a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, when you look at it closely, and I don't want to dig too far in depth into this, this is talking about during the learning time. Obviously, there's times before we really start the service and we're fellowshipping, we're talking and stuff. There's also times where we're just kind of going over different things of events that are going on that's not really teaching at all. It's just, hey, we're having this activity and we're doing this thing, we're having a potluck or whatever and just kind of talking about things. And there's obviously singing, right? This isn't referring to, to singing the hymns of keeping silent. This is specifically uh, referring to the learning time, which is the preaching time, which is when we go over God's word. And um, I don't think it could be much more clear. So when you combine 1 Corinthians 14 with 1 Timothy chapter 3, it makes sense. Okay, God is, is restricting an office here from women to do. And you know what? That's fine. There's nothing, you shouldn't be worried about that. You shouldn't be um, focused on the things that you can't do anyways. Just say, okay, well, that's one thing I'm not going to waste any time 
trying to go after that position or that job in the church, that role. It's not for me. Fine. God didn't want you to do it. Obviously, it's written in the Bible. But there's just because you don't have this one function or two, if you could, you know, you could, you can't be a, a bishop or a deacon. Okay, those are two offices within the church. That's basically about it. I mean, there's there's not really much else that's mentioned as being a role. Now, obviously, you could say. Um, I don't believe in, in even women teachers within the church where you're getting up and, and teaching when you have men sitting around or whatever, where you're kind of usurping authority because the Bible says here that they're to be obe under obedience and to ask their husbands at home. Now, um, that's within the church. That's about it, and that, that's the extent of what I'm going to cover of the prohibition because the sermon isn't about what you can't do for God, it's what you can do for God. But we need to get that out of the way just so that, you know, we could just make sure that we're clear on this issue. Uh, flip back, if you would, to Romans 16, where we started. You're going to notice here, and I love this chapter. I, I really do. I've preached a sermon on this in the past. I don't think I've done it here. But um, Romans 16 is great. I mean, you, you, you just read through like half of the chapter. He's, the Apostle Paul's just saying, hey, salute this person, greet this person. And he's naming off all of these names of people that are doing work for Christ. And on a completely side note, I just look at that and say, he cares about all these people. He cares about them enough to know them by name. I mean, he remembers them all. He's saying, hey, you're going here. Greet this person. Greet that person. Salute this person. Yo, they're doing a great work. They're doing a good job. But you know what else I notice is how many women are mentioned in this list. Look at the very first one in verse number one. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister which is a servant of the church, which is at Sancria. So he's writing to the church in Rome, to the Romans. And we see here that Phoebe is a member of the church at Sancria, right? She's a servant there. She's doing work there. And he's saying, I'm commending Phoebe unto you, verse 2, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. Now, that word succor is a little bit old, but just means she's been a helper. She has been a great help. She has been assisting me, he said, my, myself personally, and many others. She is a hard worker. She's doing work for Christ. So I want you to receive her, and hey, whatever it is she's asking of you, do it. Help her out. Help her to accomplish the goal and the work that she's trying to do there. And notice, in this instance, in what this woman is doing, it doesn't matter that she's a woman. He's not saying, well, you know, you have to listen to, to me because I'm the man and I'm telling you what you have to do with her. No, she's going and doing a work. Whatever it is, her business is. He doesn't even spot out here. He's like, look, help her out with her business, whatever it is. I know her. I know she's doing a good work. And whatever she's going to ask of you, do it. So I want to throw that out there because as we look at these other portions, it's not, uh, it's not to, to demean women to say that, you know, or to say that they're not intelligent or they're not, not capable of doing things. No, you're completely capable of serving God and you don't have to be under the authority of all men all the time. That's also not, you know, scriptural. You have to be, you're under the authority of your husband. You're under the authority of your father if you're living at home, but you're not just under the authority of every single man in the whole world. And there's a lot of work that could be done. And this, this woman, Phoebe, is the first person that he mentions is saying, look, she's doing a great work. And there's a lot of great things that you can do. And then in... Uh, Verse 6, he mentions Mary, says, greet Mary who bestowed much labor on us. And, and there's other women's names that are mentioned here, but um, just to, to point out these two, these are women that are doing a lot of work for Christ. It's not just that they're reading their Bibles. He would, he's not mentioning how much wisdom or knowledge that they have. He's mentioning how much work they're doing. And that they're actually getting things done for Christ. And I'll challenge you today to think about, you know, because as I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, we all ought to be praying. Absolutely. We all ought to be reading the Bible. We all ought to be doing a lot of these things that really no one else is going to see or know about. 
But we also, if you want to serve God, you need to be doing more than just that. And it's not to be seen of men, but the works that you should be doing should be able to just show themselves that you are serving the Lord, as the Apostle Paul knew that these women were doing. That, they, hey, they're laboring with us. They're out and doing this great work for Christ. There's definitely work for the ladies in church. And oftentimes, unfortunately, in Baptist churches, a lot of people will look as ladies as, as they don't look at them as laborers for Christ. And that there's, they kind of don't ever focus on what the women can do. And there's a lot that the women can do. Now, everyone has a different gift. God has given women different strengths than men, and we need to maximize those strengths within the church. And one of the ways you look at what, what you're good at, as I mentioned before, this really ties in so closely with 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as being different members, our church needs to function as a body. And we need to be looking out for one another. And there are areas that women are so much better at than men, and Part of that is in the caring and nurturing aspect that women have and being able to care for other members that are in need and suffering in our church. Now, everyone should be able to do this, but women are much better at this. And I think that's something, a role that can be taken on. If you say, hey, I want to help this church. I want to do what I can to help. How can I serve in this church and how can I serve Christ? Well, one of the ways you can do that, and it, you don't have to be a woman for this, I'm just mentioning because women seem to be better at it, is when there's people that are in need in the church offering some kind of help. I mean, maybe you can go over if someone's not uh, capable of doing things, you know, offering to maybe help clean up every once in a while or, or bring some meals or do things like that. Do the things that you know that you're really good at and you could, you could help with um, to help other people within the church. And that's just one example. Now, what I believe that these women were doing in Romans 16, I think one of the main things they're doing is going out and preaching the gospel and laboring for Christ in that way. And that is for all people, young, old, men, women, boys, girls. I think that everybody is, is given the job, if you're saved, to be able to preach the gospel to other people. And that, is a, and that is the most important work that you can be doing. But that is not the only job either. There's lots of things that can be done in order to further promote the cause of Christ, in order to help strengthen the body that we have here, the body of believers, in order to be hospitable. You know, and that's why the uh, qualifications of the pastor, we already read that, you know, when you're looking at that, it's not just one thing. It's not just being able to preach the gospel. There's a lot more to it than that. There's a lot more involved in being apt to teach and being hospitable and all these other things. Uh, women are the same way. It's not just about preaching the gospel, even though that's the most important thing. And, and always keep that in mind as being the most important thing. Now, what I found from the Bible, and I've studied this out many times, because I want to try to get everybody fed within our church, whether you're a man or woman, and really try to focus on everything. There's really a few, um, turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 3. There's a few things that are specifically mentioned regarding women and more co most commonly it's talking about wives. Okay, so I'm about people, women who are married. And it's not very complicated, but it's repeated over and over again in the Bible. And when you look for things that are specific to women, you're not going to find very much other than what some of the things that we're going to go over tonight. And I'm not going to go to all of the references because some of them are repetitive. You're going to find Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3 and 1, Timothy cha or 1 Peter chapter 3 and um, 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're not going to go to all of the places, but we're going to look at some of them. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 was the, was the chapter, and I should have had you keep a finger there or whatever, uh, where it went over the, the office of a bishop. But it... it gives a qualification for the wives of a bishop, too. Look at verse 11. It says, Even so must their wives be grave. What does grave mean? It's like serious, right? It means sober. It means the, the sobriety not meaning like not getting drunk, although that's part of it, but just being able to be serious. Not just, every, excuse me, everything's a joke or, or being flippant about things. Being grave, it says not slanderers, right? So you're not accusing people falsely and talking about people behind their backs being sober, and being faithful in all things. Now, the point I'm making here is that you know, a woman's job oftentimes will be a supportive role. 
So if you're married to someone, maybe they, are, they can be qualified to pastor a church someday. And maybe that's what God has for your husband to do. One of the ways that you can serve God individually is to be the wife that would not prohibit your husband from being able to fill that role. Because as, as people are being selected to, to pastor churches, not only does the man have to fill all of his qualifications and someone has to be chosen that fits that bill, they're also going to be looking at the wife. Now, it would be a shame for a man to just have all, you know, all these great qualifications, but you know what? His wife is going around and talking about people behind their back, and that's just a problem that she has. And now, all of a sudden, he's not going to be able to serve God in that capacity, or scripturally at least, shouldn't be. I'm not saying it never happens, but if people are going to be following God's qualifications and what the scripture says, he ought not to be because of this. So as a wife, you could have that. I mean, you may think it's a small thing. You say, well, my husband's never going to do that. Well, why don't you try to be that type of wife anyways? I mean, it's, and, and even for the men, and I'll get into the men later on when I teach on that, but, you know, just because it's talking about a bishop, hey, why don't you try to have those qualifications anyways? Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3, near the end of the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 3. Talking about how a woman could serve Christ. Now, in serving Christ, it's going to be looked at your works, right? And what do your works consist of? Well, part of your works are be consisted of, consisting of being obedient to the Bible, being obedient to God's Word. Those are always considered works. You know, when you're telling someone about salvation, how it's a free gift, and how it's not of your good works, you're explaining that it's not by being obedient to God's Word and keeping the law and everything else. So, on the flip side... If you are keeping the, you know, God's word and, and really following what the Bible has, has laid out for you to do and, and, and not to do, those are works and those are how you could be serving Christ with those works. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. I hope that made sense. I know it could be um, not trying to make things confusing, trying to make it a little bit easier to understand. Verse number 1, Likewise ye wives, so this is specifically being, uh, bringing up wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. And I brought this up last week about the importance of words or the meaning of words. Conversation is more than just communication like speaking. That word conversation is more encompassing in that. It's talking about the whole manner of life of the wives. Okay, But this, this, I want to focus on this first part for just a second. You will find this repeated over and over and over again throughout the Bible in reference to women being in subjection to your own husbands. This is definitely not the only time that this exists. We already saw that the woman is, is to keep silence in the church and to be in subjection and to learn from their husbands at home. And in Ephesians 5, as I mentioned before, you'll find the same exact type of wording of being in subjection to their own husbands in everything as unto the Lord, it says. In Colossians 3, you'll find the same thing. And there's only a few things. 1 Peter 3 kind of encompasses most of, of everything that's brought up specifically about women and, and wives. But this is brought up over and over again. And I think one of the reasons is because it's not always easy. And especially in our culture today, but I think just in general, probably throughout history, that people haven't changed that much. Cultures change and, and different types of value systems based on where you live change. But overall, the, just by the, the mere fact that it's brought up so many times is that God is saying, look, this is your role and I'm going to repeat it over and over and over again because you need to understand that this is important and that this is what God has laid out. In order to, you know, in order to be pleasing to God, he says, wives, if you're married, be in subjection to your own husband. Subject means that you are allowing yourself to be lower than your husband as far as the, you know, all the rulemaking and everything else that goes in the house, that he is the authority figure, that he's the one that is, that is determining the direction of the family and the way that everything's going to be. And that in order for, you know, for a wife to be in the will of God, you will be in subjection to your husband. It says that if any obey not the word, and it's referring to husbands, they also may without the word be one, 
by the conversation of the wives. You're saying, yeah, but my husband's not even a believer. You know, God forbid, maybe you got yoked up with someone, you got married to somebody, and you're both unbelievers, and then you get saved, and your husband's not saved. It doesn't matter. You can still be in subjection to your husband. Because you don't know, maybe, you know, he may be won by your actions, by you just being that, that godly woman, by just seeing that the difference in, in what, how you're living as a Christian, the way that, that the Bible says that you ought to live. Verse number two, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. What's chaste? It's pure, right? Having a, a pure conversation, the way that you, you um, act, and it's, not, uh, it's in a, a very respectable way. Coupled with fear, of course, having the fear of God. Verse number three, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now that first or verse three there, he's talking about the outward appearance. Now this should be very easy to make whatever change is necessary in your life. If you want to be in obedience and you say, I want to serve God, well, why don't you start at least with the little things? He's saying, not the outward appearance of adorning, of pla uh, you know, plating the hair, wearing gold, putting on of apparel. We're going to see, and it, it's actually not here, but um, the Bible talks about being in modest, modest dress and modest apparel and, and not bringing the attention on yourself. Right? And think about it. This makes perfect sense. As a wife, as your role of being in sub subjection to your husband, why should you be the one getting all the attention anyways and trying to draw all the focus on yourself? Being in, a, in the position of a wife, which is in subjection, is going to require humility. It's going to require you to be humble because you have to allow yourself to say, you know what, even as much as I may feel like I want to kind of take charge of here and, and, and say the way things are going to be and, and resist that authority, I'm going to just be humble, have faith in God's word, and just trust that this is what the scripture says. There's really no way around this. And I'm going to do what God says. And I'm going to be a servant. I mean, look at Jesus. If you're looking for an example of being humble and being a servant, look at Jesus Christ. The epitome of humility. He would not, you know, get uh, worked up over people not listening to him or obeying him or, or demeaning him or anything. I mean, he put up with, with all of it. And that's the son of God. I mean, that, that is the perfect example. And you could say, yeah, but my husband does this and he does that. And, he's, you know, and, he's like, and he could be wrong about all those things. But that doesn't change. God didn't put any caveats in here of, well, if your husband is, you know, this way, then you don't have to listen to him. The only one would be if he tells you to do something that is in opposition to God's law. If he tells you to do something that, that is contrary to God, you have to obey God rather than men. Absolutely. Stick with the higher powers. We read Romans 13 this morning. God is the ultimate authority. So, you cannot contradict God. God's laws come first, and then after that, as a wife, your husband's laws come next. So you, you have to be in obedience and subjection to him as long as it all falls within the realm of, of God's laws. And that's it. Now, he's saying here, when he's talking about their um, adorning, what people see, he said, I'm not, I'm not talking about the things that you wear and what you put on. He says, I'm talking about the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. He said, these are characteristics. If you want to serve God, if you want to be pleasing in the sight of God, which is exactly what he says here, which is in the sight of God of great price. He says, this is great value in God. When God looks down as you, on you as a woman, this is very valuable to him that you have a meek and quiet spirit. What's the opposite of that? Someone who's a loud mouth and going around and trying to tell everyone how to do things, right? He said here, you'd be meek. Meek is being humility, having, having a humbleness, having the, more of the, the attitude of just how can I serve you? 
as a, and, and, and quietly as opposed to just going around and dictating everything. And I, I'll promise you this. In your marriage, because this is again referring to a wife, your marriage is going to be much, much happier when you fall into that role. Now, the husband has his own role. And again, we'll go into that later. He has his own role to fill. And especially when both man and woman can fill their roles that God has given to them, you're going to find great joy and great happiness within your marriage because you're, you're, you're in step with what God has laid out for you to do. There's no better place to be than in God's will, than in the way that God designed you and, and listening and hearing his word and, and, and doing what he has laid out for us to do. So, it, it, you know, this is completely contrary to what the world is going to tell you. And I get that. And sometimes it may be hard to hear you, but you scratch your head. You're like, what are you talking about? But this is what the Bible says. Right. And God thinks it's a great price for a woman to, to be uh, wearing this ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. I don't care if the world's going to look on you and say, oh, what are you just his slave? Because the world's going to say things like that. And they're going to try to demean you and they're going to try to look down on you and say, oh yeah, he must not care about your opinion. Oh, he doesn't care about you. And try to get you worked up into being rebellion against the authority that God has laid out. The world, this drives the world mad when there's a woman who has a meek and quiet spirit and who is in subjection to her husband. They cannot stand that. Yeah. And the attack's going to come. You just watch and see. And it's going to start with family and friends and people close to you because they're going to see that. And, and they do not like to see that. But you have to decide what do you care more about? Do you care about what you look like in God's sight? Or do you care about what you look like in your family member's side? What matters more to you? Now, I get it. I care about how I look in everybody's side. I mean, everybody does, I think. But I care way more about what God thinks of me than anybody else. And if there's going to come a, a difference where I'm going to have to decide my course of action, how am I going to live my life? What am I going to do? If it means, on one hand, if I do this, God's going to be very pleased with me, but everyone else is going to hate me and no one's going to want to have anything to do with me. On the other hand, if I take the other route, I'm not going to have any problems with my family and friends. But you know what? God's not going to be happy. I'm going to choose God being happy and pleasing Him. It's not the easy path to take. The easy one is just to, to go along and get along with everybody and just do like the world does. But that's not going to be pleasing in God's sight. We're talking about how we could serve Christ and how we can be the best servants for Him. So uh, it says here, look at verse number 5 of 1 Peter chapter 3. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. Now he's going to bring up some examples of what he just said here, of meek and quiet spirit. He says, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Isn't that what we just read in verse number 1? Notice how he's repeating the same thing? Just even within five verses, being in subjection to your own husbands. Verse 6, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. He brings up the example. He's saying, look, if you want to be like these, these righteous, holy women of old time, like Sarah, he says, you're going to be obedient unto your own husband. And you think about some of the stories. We went over this when we went through the, uh, our Bible study in Genesis. Abraham was the, the head of his household. Great man. He's called the friend of God. You know, he, he had a lot of great attributes. I don't think anybody would dispute that Abraham wasn't a, you know, he, he loved his wife. He cared for his wife. But he filled his role. And when, he, you know, when, when the visitors came, he said, commanded his wife, hey, you go get this ready, get the kid ready, and we're going to serve this for, for our, our guests here. And it says, even Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And the interesting about, thing about this, him, her calling him Lord, she didn't even verbalize that. The one reference to, to Sarah calling Abraham Lord was her speaking in her own heart. When the angel of God showed up and told Abraham that he was going to have a child. And she said, she laughed within herself and said, shall I have pleasure, you know, being old? 
And, and she said, my Lord being old also in that verse. And I know I'm not quoting it 100% perfect, but that is the reference where she called Abraham Lord. And she did that within her heart. Right. So it wasn't just the outward expression of, okay, I have to do this in my mind, so I'm going to say these things in order to try to, to fit what God has for me and to be in subjection and to look like the good wife, to look like I'm in subjection in front of other people. No, in her heart, she was in subjection unto her husband because she was saying these things within herself that no one else knew except for now us because God has revealed what was in her heart at that time. And these attributes are a common theme when it comes to Scripture explicitly applied to women. It's not very complicated, yet it's repeated over and over and over again. And I think it's, it's just to drive this point home. And if, and if we could even, you know, as women, if you could get these points down, turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you could get these points down, it's going to tremendously help your ability to serve Christ and to serve God and to do what he has for you to do. First Timothy chapter 2, a big part of our service for God is our testimony in the world. It's how other people will perceive you. Now, I know we're all sinners and none of us are perfect, but the, the more out of line you are with the Bible, the more obvious it's going to be and the less people are going to have any respect for what you have to say. Just in general, myself personally, when I, when I talk to people and you have different beliefs, whatever, but I have a lot more respect for the person that could be consistent in what they believe and can point to, you know, well, I believe this because of this and this and this and, this, and you actually have reasoning for it. And, and someone who then will also try to live their lives, as we were talking about earlier this afternoon about a, a, a pastor who has completely different beliefs than we do here regarding certain topics, but they honestly believe that, and they're actually trying to convince the person, hey, this is right because of this. You know, I have a lot more respect for that person that is honestly and, and you know, intentionally believe, you know, believing those things and trying to follow through with it than the person who is, doesn't actually have a real belief and they're doing things for show and... Um, you know, they're just, they're just saying things, they don't even know why. 1 Timothy 2, look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So there's a commandment for the men. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Now, notice there's that word sobriety again. Being sober, being serious, being able to take things seriously, having shamefacedness in the way that they adorn themselves. Now, the Bible talks about nakedness being a shame all throughout the Bible. And actually, I'm going to preach a sermon on that coming up real soon, just about how nakedness is a shame because we live in a culture where people are just exposing more and more of their bodies and, and they're not even ashamed of it. And it's something you ought to be ashamed of. You ought not to be flaunting and showing your nakedness around. And I don't care if you want to call it a swimsuit or a bathing suit. Look, if you're walking around in your underwear as a woman, you're exposing your nakedness. If you walk around in your underwear as a man, you're exposing your nakedness. Unless your underwear looks something like this. <laughs> and that, that is a shame. And, and women here, when it's talking about being dressed in modest apparel, what modest means you're not drawing attention to yourself. There's lots of ways you can draw attention to yourself as a woman. Many ways. Not just one. It's not, you know, the, the common thing we think of when you say she's dressed immodestly, normally you think of, well, really low cut top and really short skirt and these things. And you know what? That is immodest. Because that is drawing the attention of men's eyes to lust after them. And I don't even care if you, as a woman, have that intention of doing that. That is what you're doing. And that is sin. I, I believe that wholeheartedly, that you should not be dressed that way. It should be modest. Not drawing that attention. Whether your intention is to do that or not, it doesn't matter. You are doing that by the way that you dress. And it says here, it's going to give some more examples, because it's, it's more than just that. There's, that's not the only thing to modesty, is, is that type of attraction for men. It says, not with broided hair 
or gold or pearls or costly array. So buying these real expan uh, expensive, fancy things, you know, all the glittery and the gold and pearls and, and, and just, just adorning yourself with all of this expensive stuff, right? We go, oh, wow, look at, oh, look at the size of that diamond. Oh, look at this, look at that, you know, and just drawing that. That's immodest. I mean, right here in the scripture, he's talking about mod wearing, you know, modesty. It's not these things, not the costly array, not the gold and the pearls and, and all these fancy things. But now he's going to say what, how you should be adorned, verse 10, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. If you're a woman and you, you know, really are concerned about how you look right in the morning and how much, I, oh man, I, gotta, I need to do this, I got to do my hair and makeup, I got to, Get this mountain, I get my outfit all right, and you know, spend all this time. Compare how much time you spent preparing yourself and how you look physically to how much time you're going to be investing in how you look in God's eyes. Now, God created you the way you did. I don't think God is up in heaven saying, Oh man, I can't believe she didn't put makeup on today. Oh man, look at that hair. She didn't use enough hairspray to lift up her hair just to the right spot. God gave you the, the, the natural beauty that you have. And you know, I believe that God thinks that all of his creation is beautiful. I honestly believe that for, you know, from head to toe. And the only reason that women think they need these things is just because they don't feel like they're attractive or beautiful or whatever. But it's not because God doesn't think you are. God gave you all of the attributes that you have. And he thinks that they're great. And you don't need to go changing them or even be worried about those. Because what God looks on, he looks on the ornament of a, of a meek and quiet spirit. And he's going to be looking at your works. So what are you doing? You're a woman. You're a servant of mine. You're a born-again believer. You're one of my servants now. And I've got work for you to do. Just as I have your husband or you know, another men, women, I've got work for all of you to do. Look. The, the, the fields are white on the harvest, but the laborers are few. And he's not just calling men laborers. He's calling men and women. Like, we need to get people out there and start reaping. Amen. You ought to be more concerned with what you're going to do that day than how you're going to look that day. Your actions speak far, far more than your, than, uh, your looks anyways. Right. I say that in your words, but you're actually going to speak more than, than your looks. And we need to be concerned with the good works. What can I be doing to serve Christ? Verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. And look at this. We're seeing this again. We saw this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, right? Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. God has ordained the authority structure, and he's saying, I have not ordained this for you. And that, that's why the two go hand in hand, being a subjection to your husband and, and you know, not usurping that authority. Uh, you're in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Flip over real quick to chapter 5. We're going to see an example here of um, which widows that a church should be taken care of and many of the good works that are mentioned here. So one of the functions of church, of the, of the local church, is to care for widows, but not just any widow. There is a requirement list given here, just like not, any, not every man can fill the role of a pastor, not every widow is someone that ought to be cared for by the church. However, it is the church's job to take care of widows who are widows indeed. That is one of the purposes of the church. Just as it was way back in the Old Testament when the tithes were brought in, it wasn't just for the Levites, it was for the fatherless and widows also. Because what happens, is, especially with women, you know, if you're a woman and you're expected to be in subjection under your husband and he's expected to go out and provide your way and to work and to work with his own hands and do all this stuff and provide for you, when he dies... You know, God's not expecting you to have to go out into the workforce now and, and to try to figure out how to survive. He's saying, you know, if you're a younger widow, which 1 Timothy 5, we're not going to read this whole chapter by any means. He says, explains, well, you know, you should find another husband, right, when you're younger. But if you're older, the church is going to take care of you. 
And uh, it says in verse number five, now she that is a widow indeed and desolate, meaning there's no one else to take care of her. She doesn't have any other family, no, no children that ought to be supporting her because the children ought to honor their father and mother and be able to take care of them. When they begin, you know, he, it's really designed for family members to be taking care of each other. But there are instances where, you know what, there's no family around, this woman's a widow, the church needs to take care of her. And so he says, hey, someone's a widow indeed, they're desolate, she trusteth in God, and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. So here's someone who has no family, is a believer, trusts in God, and continues in supplication and prayer night and day. I mean, someone who's in communication with God all the time and relying on God, God's going to answer those prayers and, and take care of that widow. Verse number 9, jump down to verse number 9. And here's some more of the qualifications. It says, Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, so they got to be 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. Another reason to, to keep up those good works. If your husband dies, right, you want to be taken care of by the church, it needs to be well reported of that you're someone who does good things. You know, you're a good worker. You're, you, you've done good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, right, being very hospitable and open and, and, and opening up your doors and, and being able to serve other people, to serve strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, big sign of humility right there, right, again, we saw the example of Jesus Christ washing his disciples' feet. You say, I'm not going to touch their dirty feet. If she had washed the saints' feet, that requires humility. Having the mind of being in subjection and also just being able to be a servant for other people. These are the attributes and the qualities that are looked for in the widow in order to say, you know what? Yeah, she's going to be taken care of by the church. If she have relieved the afflicted if she have diligently followed every good work. So those are some more examples of things to do. Being hospitable to people. Looking to, to, to help out and to do more. I mean, we're a church that we're, it's not just a, a place where you come once a week, you hear a little bit of the Bible, and then you go home. The church is a, is, a, is a family. We have fellowship here. We look out for each other and care about each other and try to see how people are doing and one of the ways you could be doing the work for Christ is seeing how much more involved you could be in other believers' lives within the church and how much of a servant and a help you can be to them. And you find out, oh, we're having visitors come through. They could stay at our place. And thank God, you know what, I love this church. And even as small as it is, we have people that have just opened up the doors and say, you know what, yeah, whenever we're having people up here, they could stay at our place. And praise the Lord for that. That's what the Bible's talking about here, being able to lodge strangers. Say, I don't even know that person. Doesn't matter. That's fine. Could, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put them up for the night. And look at diligently followed every good work. Because you have to be diligent. If you want to do work for Christ, you've got to be diligent about it. You've got to be able to, to keep that in the forefront of your mind instead of just kind of wasting your time and saying, well, I'll serve Christ when I get around to it. You're never going to serve Christ that way. Right. It's not going to happen. You have to make a, a concerted effort to say, you know what, I'm going to do this. How can I serve Christ? I'm going to, get, I'm going to show up to one of these soul winning I'm going to do what, you know, whatever it takes. I have this person. I know I'm going to be seeing you know, this person, and, and I'm going to make sure that I bring up the gospel. I'm going to make it a point to do it, because if you don't make it a point to do things like that, it'll never happen. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to bring up an example for you about Ruth and about earning rewards. Because the work that you do for Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to reward you for the work that you've done. And Ruth is a great example of a godly woman, a God-fearing woman. The story of Ruth is, is the, the woman that was um, in Moab. She was a Moabitess. And this woman, Naomi, left, uh, left Israel when there was a time of famine, a time of trouble. She, her husband, and her two sons went off into a heathen land. They went into the land of Moab. And her sons married women of the land, right? Her husband died there, and then her sons died there. So now it was just this woman left with her daughters-in-law. And the one of them, you know, and she tried to send them away. She said, okay, just go back home. You know, There's no reason for you to stay with me. And was trying to be humble with them and just say, yeah, you know, you, know, you don't need to stick around. If I were even to, to get married again today, like, You'd have to wait around forever in order to, to marry another one of my children. Because that's, that's how it went when you marry um, 
you know, one person you and your your if your husband were to die, then it would be the the brother of that person's obligation. Then, if he's not married, to take her as wife. And you know, she explained this whole thing. But Ruth said, "No, what? No, I'm going to stick with you. You know, I'm going to help you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to I'm going to be there for. You. I'm going to return unto your land." And she did a very noble thing, a very good thing, a very godly thing of helping to take care of her mother-in-law. Because her mother-in-law was a widow and she didn't have anyone to take care of her. So she said, you know what, I'll stay with you. And she went out and did whatever humble work that she could do, go out to the fields, just whoever would let her go glean the, the, the harvest, right? Just get whatever's left over from the people who were reaping the harvest. You go after them. And um, I'll read this for you in Ruth 2, verse 11. It says, And Boaz answered and said unto her, it hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. And he's saying, you know what? God bless you for that. God reward you. And he blesses her with just saying, you know what? I hope God just rewards you immensely for you being able to have the courage to come into a land that you don't know, leave your father and mother, being able to forsake your past, forsake your family, forsake your friends, and be able to come into this land and trust in God. Because she did. She was a believer. She trusted in the Lord. And, you know, we don't know all of the mind behind Ruth. But we saw that she's a godly woman. She's being praised here as a godly woman. There's an entire book of the Bible named Ruth and God's word that's, that's about this woman that did great things for God. And one of, in the way that she did that was by serving. By doing what was right, what was expected, you know, helping out and being a servant to her mother-in-law even when there was nothing physically for her to gain by doing that. She wasn't going to gain a husband. Her life was not going to be easy from that point forward, but yet she did what was right and she, she took on a servant's role. And that was of great price in the eyes of God. Now, if you're married, it can be challenging sometimes to prioritize your time and especially if you have children, it becomes harder and harder to be able to Separate, okay, I want to serve God. How can I do this? Because, um, you know, a man has only one authority figure above him, you know, God, right? God is, 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 is our head, our authority. But a woman now has to deal with two authority figures in their life. I mean, if you're a child and you're a woman, you, you know, you're dealing with your father at home, if you're living at home, or if you're married, your husband is now also another person that can dictate how you spend your time. And in order to be a godly wife, you are going to be in subjection to that, right? You're going to be listening and saying, okay, well, my husband wants to, you know, he thinks it's important. I need to be, um, you know, bringing my children here or doing this, you know, whatever it may be, it's going to be something that's going to involve your time. And when you have to be able to serve God and your husband, it's going to be hard or difficult sometimes to, to be able to manage everything. The responsibilities of raising children and, and keeping the home are very time-consuming. But I want to point this out. You're in Philippians chapter 4, right? Mm -hmm. An excellent way to be able to serve God, even with limited time, is by making it possible for other people to be successful at preaching the gospel when if you are able to do that you can add more fruit because i know for example with my wife it's hard for her to have to get the time to actually go out and knock on doors and preach the gospel now i do believe it's important for her to do that and she does do that so it's not completely forsaken but she doesn't go out as often as i go out that's just a fact. I mean, one of the reasons because I'm the pastor of the church and I am the one setting the example and leading the way for this church. But I also make it a point to make sure that she does get some time in order to do that because I believe it's important for everybody to do that. No, I mean, we all have different limitations and I understand that and God knows that too. Some people have different physical limitations where you can't just be going up and walking up and down the streets because of ailments that you have. And God understands that too, but it doesn't mean that you, you don't ever preach the gospel to people. We need to, to take what we've been given, be thankful for it, and use it to the best of our ability. 
Now, some of the things that women have an opportunity to do that men don't is, for example, if you're in the role that's kind of laid out here in the Bible and you're keeping the home and you're at home more often and you're, you're, you're taking care of those things, there's going to be, you know, you're going to be making the trips to the grocery store or trips outside. You know, you're going to be coming into contact with people that your husband probably will never come into contact with because he's just off working in the same place every day. Whereas you're going off maybe to the same place. You, you know, meet different people. You say, well, I have to get this done. I have to get this done. You need to be able to incorporate serving God into those things. So it's not going to take up too much. You don't, you don't have to make a whole separate time to serve God. You can incorporate that into the things you normally do. So, um, you know, what my wife does is a, is a good example. She has to take our kids, you know, I, I want her to be able to take our kids to learn things and to get exercise, to go to a, like a gym class where they learn uh, gymnastics. Okay, it's one of the things that they do. So, I want her to do this. She brings the kids there. That takes up some of her time. Obviously, she has to take the kids there. She has to spend time there. So, what she does then, she talks to the parents that are there. She strike up conversation with them. Then she's able to bring up the gospel to you know, and, and do the, the soul winning and the work for Christ in that way. It's a little bit different than showing up to the actual scheduled time that's in our bulletin, but she's still serving Christ. Right. And we need to be able, you know, you need to be able to do that and, and learn how to incorporate that. You know, think about the errands that you might have to run. There's lots of ways where you could incorporate getting to know people and, and preaching the gospel to them. Now, but that being said, the, the point that I was trying to make here is also being able to help someone else to be successful. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. The Bible reads, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And he's, he's praising the Philippians here, the church here, that nobody was really helping out the Apostle Paul like financially to, to do the things that he's doing. I mean, he's doing the work of an evangelist. He's going out and preaching the gospel and helping churches get started and doing all this work. And the Philippians were... They were sending support. They were helping him out. He said, even in Thessalonica, you know, he, even in like this other area, this other church, I, I should have been getting support from them, but you guys were, were, were caring for me and taking care of that. He says, not because I desire a gift, he said, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He's saying, God sees that. He sees that you are enabling me to do more by supporting me and that fruit can abound to your account. So the missionaries that we support, when we send money you know, to help people say, hey, look, do this work. Do this job. We, want, we see what you're doing is important. You're reaching people. We want you to do that as much as possible. Hey, we'll try to help you out with whatever the physical means are so that you can do that. God can see those things and it abounds to your account. So how can you do that as a woman? You know, it's not about giving money. In this situation, this is. It's referring to just what was given to him financially in order to, to support doing what he's doing. But think about if you have children, raising your children to know the Bible and how to win souls is a great way to serve God as a woman Amen. with children. If you can train them, think about the lifetime of, of, you know, in their lifetime, how many souls they can win to Christ by you teaching them and training them and taking the time to sit down and make sure that they understand this stuff. You can make them the best Christian as you possibly can there will be fruit added to your account. That is not time spent in vain. You shouldn't just be thinking, oh man, but if I was just out soul winning, I'd be, you know, invest the time in other people, especially in your children. Amen. But also in your husband. You know, if you could relieve some time, you say, you know what, I'm not, I don't really have that much time. For example, my wife, again, another good example of this, um, she has, we have a, a, an infant. You know, we have a six-month-old baby who has needs, right? I mean, he needs to be fed. He needs to be cared for. He needs to be changed regularly. You know, all these different things. It doesn't make it very conducive for walking around and, and knocking on doors. Now, sure, she can do it, and she does for limited periods of time. But overall, it's just not that easy, and there's a lot much more involved for her to be able to go out and do that, in addition to the other children that we have that, that need to be cared for and looked after and everything else. 
So one of the ways that she can serve God in that aspect is, is allowing for me to be able to have more time, to free up my time. So they say, okay, I'm going to take care of this for you. I'm already doing all these other things at home. I'm not going to really be able to make it out anyways. I'll add this to my workload so that relieves some of your time. Now you can go out and preach the gospel. It's not the glorious role, right? Just like in the church, right? You, you look at the pastor. Well, that's, the, that's what everyone's looking to and that is just the, 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 the role that that's the glorious role. That's what everyone wants to look to. And, and have, No, it doesn't matter. As, as, a, as a woman, that's not your role anyways. You, you, you're, not, you know, you're supposed to be dressing modestly. You're not supposed to be drawing attention to yourself. You're supposed to have humility and be able to be in subjection. So why not add to that being able to help your husband also be able to have that time to go out and win souls to Christ. And look, I firmly believe, based on what we see here in Philippians chapter 4, that there could be fruit added to your account as a result of that. It's a great way to serve Christ, to be able to help, to enable other people to, to, to do the work of Christ. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 31. We're almost done. Proverbs 31. The impact that a mother has on how their child turns out is like no other. That influence that you have on any person's life, when you are a mother and you spend a lot of time with your child, don't take that for granted. And even as your children are getting older, even if you have you know, children that are, you know, they might not be real little anymore, you still have... You know, and, and, it, and as they get older, it tends to be less and less of an influence, right? Because they're getting older and they're going to go off and do their own thing and, and live their own lives. But as long as you have children living under your roof, take advantage of the time that you have with them and the, the, the wisdom and the, and the teaching that you, when you invest in them, do not take it for granted. Look at all the, we're in Proverbs 31. Now, of course, Proverbs 31 has the, the, the whole passage about the virtuous woman, the virtuous woman who does things well. We're not even going to look at that. We're going to look at the first part of the chapter. And we're going to see here, look at verse number one, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. This is talking about a grown man, a king, King Lemuel, right? Who's giving the word of God here in Proverbs 31, and it was all taught to him by his mother. The credit is given back to his mom. This is who she raised. Praise the Lord for that. What a, what a great accomplishment to raise King Lemuel to be able to, to give this portion of the Bible, this, this portion of God's word. Verse number two, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. Look at verse three. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. So right off the bat, he's saying, don't allow women to rule over you. Oh, don't give your strength, your power unto them. And this is his mother teaching him this. You say, oh man, I can't believe that. She's a godly woman. She believes wholeheartedly God's word and knows her own role. And just she's teaching her son, saying, hey, this is, this is going to be something that some women that come into your life are going to try to do. Don't give your strength unto them. That's not ordained of God. Nor, not only that, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Now, what did, what did Solomon do? He gave his strength unto women because they turned his heart away from serving the Lord and they wanted an altar built to their false god. He said, okay, yeah, I'll do that and just started giving in to them, and, and that caused all kinds of problems in his own life. But look at verse 4. This is just more wisdom coming from a mother. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Great truths being taught here and being hammered home that he remembers this that much later. Hey, mom taught me not to drink. Mom taught me that if I'm going to be somebody, you know, let the, let the, let the hobo, let the, let the, the, the losers, the drunkards just, just, just fall over themselves in the gutter. He says, but you're not going to be like that. You're going to be better than that. It's not for kings to be drinking booze, to be drinking alcohol. And this stuck with him enough to be able to repeat this later on in life. Hey, mothers, drive these things home. Don't think that talking about something like that once is enough. Kids need to hear this stuff over and over and over again. That's right. 
Verse 6 says, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. So now she's teaching him to, hey, the, you know, the dumb are people that can't speak for themselves. Look out for the people to watch over them and watch out for people who aren't able to take care of themselves. You need to be able to look for them. You're going to be in a position to, to make sure that they don't just get run over and, and, and tossed aside and, um, and used and abused. He says, open, thy mouth, open your mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. All great things are being taught unto this son. As a mother, you have the responsibility and, and, and have such an impact when you can teach these great biblical truths unto your child. Last place, Luke chapter 10. I'm going to close with this. I know how busy everybody's life can be, and I know especially how busy a woman's life can be. And in all of your day-to-day -day busyness, do not become slack in doing the things that are needful. And in Luke chapter 10, we see the story of Mary and Martha and Jesus. Look at verse number 38 of Luke chapter 10. The Bible reads, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Martha was a good woman. She was, she was you know, serving, she was trying to help, she was being hospitable to her guests, and she was doing a lot of work, but she got too caught up in just doing all of that work and, and kind of neglected the needful thing. We all need to be able to take a break from the extreme busyness that we face to be able to do what's needful and to put some things aside, put some things on the back burner. You know, the home is never going to be completely clean for longer than, you know, X amount, you know depending on the situation. I know in my house, the home is never going to be clean for longer than about an hour. <laughs> that's, that's probably about, uh, unless we clean it and then leave <laughs> for a while and it's empty and then you come back home. Right. When you got all these little kids that have run around and you know what? It's a lot of work. There's all kinds of things to do. But, you know, my wife has to be able to say, you know what? We can do that tomorrow because I need to do what's needful. And, you know, and one of the things, an example just in my life, I'm sharing a lot of personal things tonight, but, you know, one of the things that, that I determine is important is that the Bible is read to our children. That is needful. This is, I mean, it, it, it lines up perfectly with this story. Mary is sitting there and listening and receiving the word of God. That was considered to be needful. Martha wasn't receiving the word of God because she was off just doing all this other work. My children need to receive the word of God, and that is important. And I'll tell my wife every day, you know what, this is way more important than you finishing the dishes or getting the laundry changed or anything else. You know, those things are important, and I want you to do those things. But you need to be able to take a break and stop and say, you know what, this is needful and we're going to stop what we're, everything else that we're doing and we're going to do this. Right. We're going to, you know, and that goes for not just, te you know, in her case, in this example, teaching the children, but how about reading your Bible? How about praying? How about doing these other things where you say, oh, I just got too busy, I need to do this and I need to do work and I need to do this. Be able to take a step back from that busyness and do the things that are needful. And this, you know, that applies to men and women, but I know how, how busy some women's life can be. So um, 
Keep that in mind. Let's never lose sight of the most important work, especially, and that's winning souls to Christ, being able to preach the gospel. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you've given us, dear Lord. It, it really is um, rather simple. There's not uh, very many things I have to keep track of here for women, dear Lord. It's, it's a few basic things, along with uh, real general principles for everybody. Uh, but I pray that you would please be able to use the women in this church. Help us to, uh, to grow, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please bless all the women in this church and, and help them to be able to uh, further serve you and to identify their strengths personally and, and the work that you have laid out for them, dear God, and that you would use them mightily in, uh, in service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.